right, let's go to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Um, I want to talk today about uh, contentment, but I want to uh, kind of uh, maybe even bring up a couple levels possibly of contentment and uh, steer you toward one of those. But here in uh, 1 Timothy 6, um, he, he does jump into uh, false teachers uh, the beginning of 1 Timothy 6, where uh, uh, if any man teach otherwise, if there's somebody that's telling you something else uh, and consents not to wholesome words, even to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth." supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. All right, uh, from such withdraw thyself. Um, now, there's a, we, we don't like to withdraw. We like to be the fighting fundamentalists. Um, but there's sometimes, later on in this chapter, it tells us to flee certain things. And so there are, uh, there are certain sins that are going to grab a hold of our heart because we're prone to those sins, and one of those is we like hearing someone talk about gain, being godliness, and having. And uh, when, you, when you've, you've been on guard, you, I've got to guard against this sin and guard against this sin. Then, then you find a false teacher that tells you that, no, no, actually, this, uh, if you think of it this way, it's actually good to go this way. And, and maybe uh, uh, follow after riches because that's, a, that's a, a sign that you're close to God. And maybe go out, oh, man, your heart uh, goes after those kind of things. Um, the Bible says, from such withdraw thyself, flee some of these things. Find out what your heart is drawn toward, then stay away from those things. You don't want to go toe-to-toe with everything. Sometimes you've got to get out of there, like Joseph in Potiphar's house. So, um, so the supposing that gain is godliness, he says in verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. So it was a while ago I was thinking, why does he say godliness with contentment? Doesn't godliness just tie in everything? Wouldn't like godliness. <laughs> it's like, but godliness is great gain. I mean, isn't that an umbrella term that pulls in everything, right? Godliness. We can have one verse in the New Testament. Godliness is good. Ungodliness is bad. You know, that could just, it seems like it could cover a whole lot with just that. But godliness with contentment. So godliness is going to be following after. We'll look at that if we have time as well in the, at the end of this chapter, uh, a following after certain things. But we're tempted to, as we follow Christ, add things. Um, as, as I pursue God's blessings, as I pursue this or that, I wonder if I can also add this or that. And I think this passage is telling us, be careful what you add, because you only have one life, and it's but a vapor. Keep things simple so that you can can conserve a lot of your strength and conserve a lot of your brain power and conserve a lot of your life to go after the things that are meaningful. Godliness with contentment. I think part of what it's saying here is to be content with godliness. Don't live a godly life and then add to it other things. Be content with the meaning that's already there in godliness. So I, I kind of want to preach a sermon today, content simply with godliness. Let's pray. Lord, I do pray that uh, you'd help me. Lord, uh, this is the first time I've, I've preached this message. Lord, I have some, some thoughts that, that I asked you to help me tie it together, Lord, that I, I think you've been giving to me. But Lord, sometimes that tying together process can be rough. So Lord, I'm just asking for your help today. And I pray that you bless this time that we have. I ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right. So uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5, you don't have to go there, talks about God being the God of all comfort. But money can be pretty comforting too. You know, I go, my, my car breaks down and somebody hands me a couple thousand dollars, that's pretty comforting. You know, and, and so, of course, God put it on that person's heart to give me that money. But you're thinking, oh, if it's one or the other, it seems like if, if I'm going to get comfort from God, it seems like I need to care about what he wants. Um, um, it's almost like I have to be his, and I have to be, I don't know, it sounds like a lot of work, possibly, to find out what God wants and to be in the will of God. And then, then I can lay hold on that comfort. But if I had money, well, I wouldn't need comfort from God. I could buy my own comfort. And then instead of me being God's, that, that the access to that comfort would be mine. 
to do with as I please. That would be pretty good. So uh, money can, can uh, take the focus off of God and put it on myself. And somebody used the illustration of, uh, of a mirror. Uh, and it was kind of an interesting. I, I stole my wife's mirror. Hope it didn't mess her up on picture day. <laughs> she has another one. Um, um, so anyway, picture, uh, anyway, picture, mirror, uh, a mirror is kind of made up of, of two parts. There's glass and then there's a, like a silver reflective surface behind the glass. Now glass is kind of interesting cause you can see through it. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of fun. You can, you can drive and you can see other cars. This, it works out really well. I can see through glass and, and, uh, but this has uh, glass and, and uh, there's a reflective surface that kind of interrupts what I see. So with glass, I can, I can, I can look through it and see the, the people around me. But when you add that silver reflective surface, it interrupts what I see as I look through the glass. Then that silver on the other side casts an image of my... Oh, I'm sorry. Is this what you've been looking at? <laughs> you see a picture of yourself. And somebody used the illustration. They said, boy, when, uh, when you have a life where you can see others, then money starts to creep in. And you're, and you're not watching the effect money has. Pretty soon that silver gets in the way of what you see. Instead of seeing everyone around you, instead there's only one person that's important to you, and that's the, the reflection upon that silver on your own life, us. And so we have to really watch that. Now in this, in this passage here, uh, let, me, let me go ahead and read a little bit further. Um, so we're in uh, 1 Timothy 6, um, verse uh, 7. And he says, We brought nothing into this world. It is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be fall, uh, will be rich, fall into temptation. Again, let me point out, they that will be rich. They that will be rich. It's not, it, this isn't a warning just to rich people. This is for us that like the idea of being able to depend on me and my own wallet. All right? Because it's inconvenient sometimes to be looking to God. Sure, we kind of like those testimonies where they, they sit down, there's nothing to eat. And they sit down and pray and thank God for the food. And then there's food at the door. But deep down, we'd rather have plenty of food in the cupboards and, and not have to sit there and, and wonder. Because a father, uh, sure, he's, he's, he's teaching his children wonderful things there. But a father, at the same time, he's like, man, I, I don't want to be dependent. I want to be dependable. But true dependability is teaching your children that you have one that you depend on. Not that, da- that dad doesn't depend on anybody, but I have to depend on God just like you depend on dad. Dad depends on someone each and every day. God told us, rich or poor, to come to him and say, give us this day our daily bread. No matter how much money you have in the wallet, God wants me to come to him every day and say, God, my needs are dependent upon you as the great provider. But it just, ugh, just, it just works out so much better if I can just leave God out of the equation and get anything and everything I want. That's in our hearts. They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the judgment and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. And then jump down to verse 17. So they, they just talk to the people that want to be rich, but then there are other people that are rich, which in many regards, that would be like everybody in America. We Americans like to get, get mad at the 1%. Well, if, if the rest of the world, we are the 1%. Um, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches. All right? That money comes, that money goes. But in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. There's a theme in there, isn't there, to keep the, uh, the things of eternity in our minds. Now, you don't have to go there, but the, the rich young ruler there in in Luke 18, uh, verses 18 through 24, he, he came to the Lord and he had some questions. And the Lord told him, I want you to do this and do that. And, 
And it was too hard for him because he was going to have to learn to lay aside that money that he depended on and trust the Lord Jesus Christ instead. And uh, he wasn't ready to do that. And, and again, let me just point out again that the, the money is neutral. Money is just something we use to accomplish things, but it's the love of money that can become a disease of our soul. It can cause uh, people to cheat on their taxes to get a little bit more. It can cause them to rethink. Every year I have to rethink and, um, as I'm like, oh, with my giving, Lord, what, a, what a, am I actually making? Um, what, what am I giving? And, and it, it, it skimp on your giving, view things. Uh, it can cause parents to, uh, to overwork, to, to make tons of money and hire someone else to raise their children. So again, we notice this wasn't just a warning for the rich. But with this rich young ruler, boy, he came and he went away sorrowful. He couldn't part with his money. And, and why? What is it about money? Well, m- money projects a sense of status, doesn't it? It kind of helps us with our identity. I want my, the, the image that I project to reflect my status. And that's why God's afraid to bless us. Because if I'm here and God, God blesses me here, well, I- immediately I can't just be here. I got a boom. This is my new status and it has to be reflected in, my, in the way I dress. And this, well, maybe God gave me that extra money because he wanted me to give towards something. And, and then dress, maybe there's nothing wrong with dressing sharp. Today's picture day. Some of you forgot. I can tell. <laughs> All right. And, and dressing up, uh, looking sharp, having a clean tie, you know, not having yesterday's lunch on my, on my tie. That's a good thing. All right. Purchasing something new and sharp. My wife drags me to the store here and there. And says, you need this, and this is out the door. I'm like, oh, come on, that's my favorite suit that we, you know, I got married in, or whatever. <laughs> um, Doth not clothes make the man? Well, you know, we, we're so careful about the, my, the money reflects who I am. Why? Why does that reflect who? Aren't, you, aren't we supposed to find our identity in the Lord Jesus Christ? But I find my identity in what I have. That's why God's afraid to give me anything. Because I identify with that instead. Um, I think, so I think the rich young ruler probably had some nice clothes on. All right? But he forgot that the Bible says, you know, um, there's, there's a better place to invest where moth can't get at those clothes. He was rich, but I still don't think he had mothballs. So, I, you know, boy, he had, to, he had to worry. I'm like, oh, my threads, which would have been hand-stitched. Way back then, he probably had some expensive clothing. This is a reflection of who I am. I can't lay this aside. This is who I am. Oh, my, don't be that way where God is afraid to bless you because he wants you to be who you are. And if he blesses you, he's like, Lord, you're good. What, can I give more to you? And instead of I have to go up here and then you get a pay cut, and you're like, uh-oh, what am I going to do? I'm already living here. I'm already living here. I can't go down to here. I'm, I'm living where am, I, where am I? And, of course, being American... Using credit, we live just beyond, and then we're in trouble. If God says, I want a little bit more, or you have a pay cut, or, or if God leaves in your heart like Brother Rose that says, hey, take this job so you can spend more time with your kids. You won't be making as much money, but, oh, no, but God, I... All right. It also promotes the feeling, so it projects a sense of status and promotes the feeling of satisfaction. I like having an appetite and then going and do something about it the moment I want to. You know, when I crave something, I can just go. Brother McGovern talked about being on the mission field and just craving uh, a bag of Doritos. And he, and, he just, and, he, and he let it start to eat at him a little bit. That he goes, man, God, I'm serving you, and something as simple as a bag of Doritos I have no access to. And he kind of he let it eat at him for a little bit. And uh, one day there was this, miss, there was this shipment that, that, that went over to a, Papua New Guinea, and, and there was all these, there's this, all these Doritos at this one little market that weren't supposed to be there, but somehow got, and he, and he, just, he just laughed at himself because he goes, oh, Lord, um, why, why am I focused on what I'm giving up? Um, satisfaction, my definition is sometimes being able to get what I want when I want it. And it seems like with cash, I can just do that, but it's not quite as special as when God just hands you a blessing. The problem with satisfying myself every time I want to be satisfied is I'm full. And when you're full, you don't want that blessing. If I go home after stopping by the gas station and getting a, a, a two donuts and a Pepsi, all right, and then I get home and my wife lovingly prepares some dinner, I'm not interested. I can pretend, but I'm not truly interested because that didn't protect my appetite. But money can promote the feeling of satisfaction. 
Um, you've heard of comfort food, right? There's comfort shopping. It's, it's a thing. You can punch in retail therapy. Retail therapy. It's, a, it's when you, uh, go to, you buy something in order to make the, make the purchaser feel, not because you need it, because I just need a new whatever to make myself feel better. Um, so it projects a, a sense of status, promotes a feeling of satisfaction, provides a sense of security. Um, boy, when you get a little older, you're going to want to think about a retirement, insurance, money in the bank account. Um, but, but money can, can provide all these things, a, a, a counterfeit sense of all these things. But my status is supposed to come from who I am in the Lord Jesus Christ. My satisfaction should be drawn from the Lord Jesus Christ. And in fact, it's fun to say no to certain things. If you crave something today, say no periodically. And just say, I, 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 like, to, I like to maintain an appetite for when God hands me a blessing, I want to be extra hungry. Because when you're hungry, food tastes better. And when you're hungry for spiritual things, because you, they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, how are you going to be hungry when every time you have a craving, you, you have a way to satisfy it yourself? And you're not looking for God's blessing. All right? So the Christian life is not about acquiring more and better material things. It is instead an active life of faith that continually finds its sufficiency and contentment in Christ alone, whatever one's outward circumstances might be. Um, now, yesterday, Alec went to David Hahn's house for an airsoft battle. All right, so, let, so um, they were running around shooting each other with little plastic balls, and it was lots of fun. So I was imagining a scenario that, let's say there's, there's five of those guys, and maybe Brother Hahn comes near the end and says, hey, your, your fathers are going to be here in a little bit. I brought a pizza. Enjoy, and he sets it down. Now, young men, you ladies, young men do math really quick in a time like that. Five of us ate slices of pizza. There's enough for seconds, but not for everybody. And so, you know, they're, they're crunching the numbers in their mind, and so they have that slice of pizza, and, and maybe one of them is super spiritual. Let's, let's thank God for this, you know, and it's, as he's wolfing it down so he can grab that second slice. And so there, there he is, and you're, you're crunching the numbers, you're like, and so you're worried. I, I, that, that, that second slice, there's not enough for everyone to have that second slice. And, and it wouldn't look good if I just grab a second slice while I still have one in my hand. So I've got to get rid of this one as quickly as possible. So, so boy, the amen happens and it's like, and you're starting to move toward that second slice. And then maybe I pull up. And then Brother Hans like, hey, Brother Mitchell, we got pizza over here. And like, oh, 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 this is our pizza. And I was like, would you like a slice? Absolutely. Well, here, he grabs the box and hands it to me, and maybe a couple more dads start to show up, and we finish off those last three slices. The problem there with covetousness is his mind was on the slice he didn't have yet and didn't enjoy the slice he did have. Okay? The slice he had was, was gone. His brain was on the slice he didn't yet possess, and so the slice he did possess, he, he didn't enjoy at all. So covetousness is when your mind is worried about what you don't possess so that you're not thinking at all about what you already do possess. Contentment would be like, I have a slice of pizza. I had no idea Brother Han was going to bring us some, and he didn't actually, but, but I was just imagining the scenario. Well, I don't know, did you guys have, where's my slice of pizza? Okay. Um, so you have the slice of pizza. So contentment level number one would be, I got this slice of pizza. And there's more there, but, but I'm going to enjoy this slice. And so you eat that slice. Now, um, contentment level number two is where you look beyond the slice and you say, God, you are so good to me. You just can't help yourself. You just bless me over and over and over again, you just can't, you're such a good God. And then as he's about to take the bite, he notices that one of the fellas who's maybe a visiting or something drops his slice. And then the other three are gone. Because there I am and the other couple dads, and, and we made short work of our slices of pizza. And there you are, and you look, and this person's uh, pizza fell uh, cheese first. And the grease and the cheese is uh, all mixed together with the dirt. And uh, he looks down, and you think, you think, but, you're, but, but the pizza is not what you treasure. In your heart, the contentment level number two is, God, you're just so good. And so you're like, hey, I want you to have this. 
It's like, I could, no, no, take it, take it. And in your mind, you're just like, God can't help himself. He just loads me up. And, and, and I'll give this to you, and, and, and he'll just take care of me again. Uh, that's contentment level number two. And I think we can see it in Scripture here. So um, uh, in, in Hebrews 13.5, it talks about uh, let's not be covetous. Uh, let, let our conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Why are we content with what we have? And then he says, I'm here. Well, we're looking beyond what we have to the one who can't help himself, but bless us. Again, we talked about this with Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son. The prodigal son said, Dad, I would like a treasure, and I'd like to take off with that treasure. All right? And then while he was gone, he discovered that he took off without the treasure. The treasure was his father. So he spent what he thought was the treasure and came back, realizing the true treasure was not what he got from the father, but the father himself. Now, this scares me back in Genesis 33. So maybe keep a finger here in in 1 Timothy 6. But Genesis 33, you ever go to a door and you want to tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ and they just just shut you off right away and they say, I'm good. I'm good. Esau kind of says something similar here in, in, in Genesis 33. Now, Jacob was afraid to run into Esau. And so Jacob uh, puts together this present to send to Esau. Uh, Genesis 33, 1, Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau came, and with him 400 men. And he, Jacob, divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel and unto the two handmaids. He put the handmaids and their children foremost, and Leah and their children after. Uh, so let's, let's jump to verse 4. Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. And he lifted up his eyes and saw the women and the children and said, Who are those with thee? And he said, The children which God thy hath graciously given thy servant. Then the handmaids came near, uh, they and their children, and they bowed down, and Leah also. Uh, And then verse 8, And he said, What meanest thou by all this drove which I met? And he said, These are to find grace in the sight of my Lord. And Esau said, I have enough, my brother. And uh, you have contentment level number one. The problem with Esau is he was content with what he had, and Jesus wasn't one of the things he had. All right? Contentment level number one can be had by the unsaved. So if you're there and you're like, no, I I pound, whenever I get covetous, I just really focus on what I have. That can be dangerous too. No, I'm content. I really, really focus on what I have. I focus on the one slice of pizza I do have. Well, then when that person drops his his pizza and, and your heart is tugged to give it away, and you're like, no! All right? I'm spiritual. I'm content. Leave me be. All right? I'm, I, I'm, con, I'm content, and that's good, <laughs> all right? Well, Esau's unsaved, and this is part of the reason why the Bible says, uh, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated, because here was a person that found contentment without Christ being a part of it, and that's not the way it's supposed to be. I have enough. Hey, can I tell you about the, hey, I'm good, all right? Take your little Bible verses and go to the next door. I'm good. All right, I have enough, my brother. Keep that thou hast thyself. And Jacob said, Nay, I pray thee, if not I have found grace in thy sight, then receive my present at my hand, for therefore I have seen thy face, as though I had seen the face of God, that thou wast pleased with me. Take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee, because God hath dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. There was a contentment there because of who he had. While Esau, there was a contentment because of what he had. And Jacob said, I can part with this because I'm not parting with God. I'm content because of who I have, not because of what I have. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 33. In Exodus chapter 32, Moses was on top of Mount Sinai, and he was up there for a while, and and they said, Aaron, make us gods that we can worship. And so Moses comes down from off the mount and he finds that they've been, uh, they've been committing this idolatry. God is, uh, uh, God is giving them the law and, and no sooner... And, and God basically, at the, at the beginning of chapter 33, he says, I can't go with you because um, this people is so irritating that if I'm with you, I might consume them. 
It might be better if I just send an angel with you. See that there at the beginning, uh, 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 Exodus 33, uh, 2. And he says, I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite and the Amorite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Um, and of course, verse 4, it says, when the people heard these evil tidings, and you say, that's not evil. What? Well, the thing is, Jesus or, or God said, I, I don't think I can go with you. I'll send my angel instead. This people is so stiff-necked and this and that. And boy, the, but Moses just, he, 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 says, he says, oh God, and, and, and he pleads and, and all these things. And we get down to verse 14, um, or verse 13. Uh, Moses says, now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way that I may know thee, that I might find grace in thy sight and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, if thy presence go not with me, carry us not up. Hence, don't send me with an angel. Can't you be content with what you have? An angel to help you along the way? Nope. No, I can't. I can't. Because I don't, if you're here, I want to stay here. And if you'll go, then, then, then go. But if you're not coming, please don't send us anywhere. That level two, not content with what you have, but content with who you have, so that what you have is constantly at his disposal. Because he can't help himself. You give something to God, and he's like, oh, yeah, I'll play this game. I love playing this game. And you know what? We can love playing the game because he's a lot better at it than we are. The game of who's going to be a blessing to whom. So let's go back to... uh, um, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and give just some closing thoughts. All right, so as far as the things I possess, um, verse 7 reminds me of something. He says, uh, we brought nothing into this world. <laughs> so he's, he's like, you can be content with godliness. Can I? Yes, you can. Let me give you some thoughts to chew on. Verse 7 we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. All right, you came into this world with zero and with no ability to acquire anything, and you were taken care of. Somehow, you came into this world with nothing and zero ability to do something. All you had was a bank account full of a currency known as time. Somebody took care of you, and, and God you know, allowed whoever took care of you to have the strength and the, and the compassion and the wherewithal to take care of you. That care came from Almighty God, and he used somebody to do it. Job said the same thing. Job 121, naked came out of my mother's womb, and, and naked shall I return. The psalmist said the same thing. Solomon in Ecclesiastes, he, he said the same thing. All right? So I came into this world and couldn't, I could do nothing about uh, providing for myself, and somehow I was taken care of. All right? Enjoy that fact that someone was there before you could provide for yourself and that person is still here. Um, And because of that, when you get old enough to make some decisions about that bank account that God filled up with time, when you go on work, you're trading time. You're trading the currency that God gave you for some money. All right? You're trading the currency that you didn't earn. God just gave you a bank account full of it. And you trade that away and make some money. So what you do with that money reflects what you believe about the person who gave you the currency to begin with. So in the Bible where it says, lay not up for yourselves treasures on this earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, rich young ruler, tied to your, tied to your status. Where are we in investing in this earth? where things depreciate and are moth-eaten and you, buy, you, you, you pour some money into that car and rust begins to take it to pieces or a thief comes and steals what you treasured. All right, verse 8 gives us another thought. Having food and raiment, let us be there with content. All right, food and raiment. Uh, raiment uh, not only has the idea of clothing, but a, but a shelter. So having, having covering and clothing and a shelter. By, by the way, we have all that we need. And you say, uh, 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 time out. It doesn't say salvation. But keep in mind that he's talking to a church. So a church member, by the definition, has the Lord Jesus already. So absolutely, if you have food and raiment, um, 
And without Christ, you have nothing. But this church member has the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a church member, I got a little bit of food. God created us low maintenance. Think about that. And we allow ourselves to become high maintenance if we're not careful. God wants us to live a low maintenance life. All right? Um, uh, uh, Jay Leno has 169 cars and 117 motorcycles and counting. But he can only drive one at a time. So basically, that one car he's able to, to drive at a time does basically what my car does. Maybe a little faster, maybe a little shinier. But basically, my car does the same thing. John McCain, at a, at, a, at, a, at a debate one time, they said, how many homes do you have? He's like, mm, I'm going to have to have my staff get back with you on that. I mean, just that is just like, huh? <laughs> I don't have to think about that much at all. Um, he had seven homes, turns out. John Kerry had nine. Our president only has five. Poor guy. <laughs> I'm going to send him some, you know, donation. So having food and raiment, let us be there with content. And then back in, in, uh, in Matthew 6, 25, he says, Is not the life more than meat? Is not the body more than raiment? I gave you a body and I gave you life. I provided more important things and less important things like food and raiment. You, you don't think I'm good for that? Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Don't worry about those things. Make sure your life is low maintenance enough so that you're not too tied up that you cannot... Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then watch God add all these things. And then he says uh, in verse 9 and 10, he says another reason to just live this, simp this, this con be content with godliness is there are great dangers for those that set their heart to pursue riches. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while um, some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So verse 9, it actually says, uh, um, uh, and which drown men in destruction. I found an interesting story. Uh, in, late in the 1800s, uh, there was a man named Yosef the Terrible Turk. Yosef the Terrible Turk. And he, uh, he was a wrestling sensation in, uh, in France. And so he came over to the U.S. and, and went around and was just defeated. They, they said that his strength, he would come at you like a bull and he knew all sorts of uh, uh, painful submission holds and you would kind of, you would want to feel him out, but seconds later you were tapping out because you couldn't breathe and he was just so powerful. Well, he, he made all these winnings and he, he had all his winnings confer, converted to gold and then he had this special belt made so that he could wear his 40 to 60 pounds of gold around his, his waist. And then he started heading back to, uh, to Europe. And uh, July 4th, 1898, his ship, the La Bourgogne, um, collided with another ship. And as they were trying to rescue the people, get them into life, life rafts, you know, there was this little jump he had to make to get into the life raft. Well, with 40 to 60 pounds of gold on you, you can't jump as far as you thought you could even if you are like a world-famous panther or wildcat or whatever the other one is. You know, try doing the high jump with 40 to 60 pounds of, of metal around your waist. All right? He missed the boat, and there was no time to rescue him. He was gone. What was his life worth? What was his life worth? Well, it was, it was that, that, that treasure that he had around his, race, his waist. And the Bible says here um, that... Many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. You know, it says withdraw from these things, uh, flee, uh, follow. And of course, he gives, us a little, he gives us a little formula down here of what to do with your time. And just enjoy godliness. Don't enjoy godliness and add to it things. It's like, God, following you isn't that interesting. I, I want it to be a part of my life, but I want to add some other things that are... No, no, no. Find all your interest and just following the Lord Jesus. Stay away from these other things that rob you of that interest, and then fight for the Lord while you have breath. Let's pray. Lord, I, I thank you for uh, um, allowing me to get through the main things that I, I think you laid on my heart, Lord. 
I pray that it would be a help to these folks, Lord. I pray that you bless this, this time of invitation. And Lord, this, this idea of contentment, help us to, yes, appreciate what I have. Take care of what I have, but help me to look beyond what I have and to treasure who I have, to look through those things so that what I have is constantly at the ready to go into whatever service you need it to go into. Lord, I, I just pray that you work on our hearts. Help us to have this, uh, this true idea of contentment. I ask these things in Jesus' precious name, amen.